we were uh, discussing the uh, applications of gas chromatography. In that, first of all, we had taken reaction gas chromatography, and um, the idea is to inject the substances that uh, pass through a reaction zone ahead of the um, injection port or within the injection port or in a column or a post column. So, the reaction before the column um, would facilitate formation of different compounds which will be easily separated as components, but post column reactions would be normally meant for uh, uh, identification of the substances that are already separated something like derivatiz derivatization etcetera. So, we had discussed about the straight chain uh, alkanes and cyclic alkanes and branched alkanes mixtures if we have we had discussed that um, phi angstrom unit molecular sieve, molecular sieve can be used for um, the separation and um, we had discussed that uh, around 268 degree centigrade hexane is not absorbed from a mixture of hexane, heptane and octane. So, if hexane is not absorbed the hexane will be coming out. So, other uh, substances would be absorbed. So, this is some uh, an example of a reaction chromatography. Another uh, reaction chromatographic uh, technique I had uh, discussed is uh, about the olefins and aromatic mixtures. So, there we had discussed that uh, 20 percent mercuric sulphate if we use um, in a solution of 20 percent sulphuric acid only aromatics will be coming out of the column and the olefins would be absorbed in the solutions. Remember that this is not a separation process on massive scale, it is only in the um, microliters scale. So, a small quantity of the reaction zone, a small quantity of the reactants as well as a small portion of the column can be converted into reaction uh, gas chromatography. So, you suppose uh, we have both uh, we use 4 percent silver sulphate in 95 percent uh, sulphuric acid, we would be retaining both the olefins and aromatics. That means, all the unsaturated compounds would be absorbed by using this mixture. Now, suppose you have water and uh, you want to remove the water because water uh, could be sometimes an impurity, it may not be necessary to determine the water content. So, you would like to remove it from the column. So, for that we can use magnesium perchlorate solution or a molecular sieve or we can use uh, P 2 O 5 that is phosphorus pentoxide and calcium sulphate and then calcium carbide. In all these things water will be removed except in calcium carbide if the water content would be, there would be a reaction generating the acetylene. This is a very standard reaction any organic chemistry textbook would, uh, pr uh, would be dealing with this reaction you can look up the details of the reaction in uh, these things. Then similarly, if you have co cobalt co carbon monoxide you can use iodine pentoxide which will oxidize it to CO 2 which can be easily s separated by um, gas chromatography. And then second type of uh, substances reaction is very uh, useful because if you have the non volatile components many of them would not elute. Therefore, what we do is we subject it to a flash pyrolysis that means, pass the components through a hot uh, wire um, something like a heated filament 
probably you can use a pl platinum or tungsten for about 15 to 20 seconds at high temperature or you can pass through even a high voltage corona discharge in a ceramic cylinder. So, smaller fragments um, are generated with lower boiling points and uh, such compounds will give chromatographs of the pyrolysis products which are characteristics of the specific compounds that is parent compound under the specific conditions what we have employed for the gas chromatography. Elemental analysis basically uh, happens during pyrolysis at high temperature and uh, very simple products like C carbon, CO2, water and small mo smaller molecules are usually generated. Now, there could be uh, you can conduct reactions as class reactions. For example, if you take fatty acids, make them react with boron trifluoride in methanol medium, you would be generating methyl esters and these methyl esters having lower boiling points would be very easy uh, be, uh, to separate instead of fatty acids which are having higher boiling points and they could be solids many of them. So, other uh, reactions which I want to detail here are sterols, sugars and OH groups and those things you can react with hexamethyl disilazine and trimethyl chlorosilane uh, to get silane derivatives which can be easily chromatographed. And similarly, fatty alcohols and uh, or OH groups, uh, here OH groups can be converted into acetylation, but the acetylation reactants are acetic anhydride in pyridine, in pyridine medium and uh, again you would be generating the acetylation products uh, which can be easily separated. Amino acids also similarly you can convert them into methyl ester hydrochlorides and uh, uh, an interesting aspect of uh, uh, such reactions are uh, uh, the that several reaction kits are available for conducting the reaction gas chromatograph. So, uh, you can depending upon your applications, you can buy different kits and then incorporate either in the pre column or injection phase, injection port or uh, post column etcetera and then they can be easily separated. Now, you can I want to discuss with you something about program temperature gas chromatography. Here what is happening? is suppose you have compounds having a wide range of boiling points and um, you would know you uh, intuitively that in chromato gas chromatography compounds with lower boiling points would be coming out first and then higher boiling points would be coming out later and all the separation depends upon the partition coefficient. Now, compounds with higher boiling points would be would be low having low volatility and in general they will not come out. Suppose you have a mixture of compounds which are having a low boiling as well as high boiling mixtures compounds in a given mixture then you will it will take enormously long time to separate the compounds for which the analyst may not have the time nor the patience. So, as the, the what we normally do the trick is while the column gas chromatograph is being operated, we plan to raise the temperature of the column and uh, in a standard uh, uh, manner of about 4 degrees uh, per minute or 10 degrees per minute, 5 degrees per minute like that. So, that as the lower volatile compounds, compounds with lower boiling points would be coming out but at the same time slowly we are increasing the, um, the temperature of the column. So, that non volatile components would also get sufficiently volatilized and start moving down the column. Subsequently, they will emerge out. So, here you can see in the slide that what I have written is that 
the wide range of boiling points can be the separation can be improved or accelerated by heating the entire column at a fixed rate during the run. As the temperature is reached raised solubilities will decrease and the vapor pressure will increase and the compounds will start migrating. So, temperature programming basically results in time saving sharper peaks and uniform peaks. So, heating from ambient to 400 degree centigrade within 8 minutes is possible while cooling can be effected from 400 to 100 degree centigrade within 2 to 3 minutes. So, that is the advantage of gas uh, reaction gas um, that is temperature programming. So, program temperature gas chromatography is a very useful technique. For example, you can see in this slide that we, we have hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, ethane, carbon dioxide etcetera and then ethylene etcetera. You can see that these um, around the, uh, the starting temperature is 35 and around 100 degree centigrade you would get mostly hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide. In this range all of them will come out, but uh, the ethane will not come out until the temperature is reached around 140 to 150 degree centigrade. And um, then even the um, uh, elution time is approximately 15 minutes. So, if you do not heat then the graph would uh, you would not be able to see the graph in a single uh, screen and uh, you may it may extend beyond the screen and uh, you will have to compress, but if you are heating the column subsequently the whole graph can be obtained. Same thing is true with respect to carbon dioxide and here in this case you can, you can imagine that um, a pyrolysis has already been carried out because most of the products are uh, um, uh, very simple products like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, methane, ethane etcetera and carbon dioxide also would be one of the products, but that comes out around 200 degree centigrade. And then the time is also about 28 minutes elution time and ethane, ethylene would be still longer and it would be coming out around 295. This example very clearly illustrates that uh, the temperature has got a very profound effect on the uh, separation of the compounds. So, the number of theoretical plates for a program temperature gas chromatography is usually given by this expression that is n is equal to 16 V t r divided by W whole square that is equivalent to isothermal G C. Essentially the same degree of resolution is obtained provided heating rate is around 1.5 degree cent degree um, 1.5 delta T above the isothermal temperature. This is only a guideline, it is not it does not happen all the time. Now, I would like to discuss with you about flow programming. Now, we have discussed about temperature programming where it was not possible to separate low volatile components as well as um, very high volatile components in a single run. Now, uh, we have raised the temperature and separated the substances. There, there is an inherent assumption that uh, the temperature raising of the temperature does not decompose the substance, it does not destroy the compound. Now, suppose you are dealing with enzymes and uh, proteins and other things as you keep on raising the temperature, there is a danger of substances getting decomposed at higher temperature. So, instead of getting the products uh, as such that is the chromatograms of the substances which you want to separate, you would be separating the compounds which have undergone decomposition sometimes it is not acceptable quite often. Therefore, we use another trick that is known as flow programming. What we do here is here the carrier gas flow rate we keep on increasing and then during the analysis when we increase the carrier gas flow rate sweeping the we are almost forcing or sweeping the components 
from one theoretical plate to another theoretical plate. So, but we will be doing it more readily through the column. Since the peak height is proportional to the retention time and hence the flow rate, the height of the emerging peaks is raised as the analysis proceeds because the compound keeps on coming out much faster than it would have if the flow rate was had been kept constant. So, a major advantage of flow programming is that thermally unstable components can be analyzed without the loss of the material and so also the volatile liquid phases can be separated very easily. In this uh, slide that I have put the basic requirement and uh, in the next slide uh, the flow programmer is pneumatically a controlled system incorporated in the gas chromatographic instrument. You can do it even with um, a computer by giving a MS DOS command to increase the flow rate. So, that permits the pressure along the column to raise logarithm to rise logarithmically during a predetermined time interval. It is a differential flow wall installed in the carrier gas supply line basically. So, higher gas flow rates generally cause lower efficiency but the resolution may be poorer and then the optimum conditions. This is a sort of um, restriction uh, quality reduction where I accept, um, but a higher flow rate also improves the baseline drift problem. The baseline drift will remain steady during much of the time because small variations in the flow rate does not matter when you are have increasing the flow rate. So, both FID and TCD should be useful with flow programming. So, there are other aspects like gas solid chromatography. So far, we have been discussing only the gas liquid chromatography. Now, uh, what I would like to do gas chromatography can also be used to separate the substances which are uh, in general substance uh, column materials which are solids by themselves. Earlier we had used the columns and the column support material was coated with a high boiling liquid material which could be polar, non-polar or intermediate polar etcetera, etcetera. Now, what we are trying to do is we are using the solid support itself as a column material. So, that is known as gas solid chromatography it is not very, um, very well uh, developed, but um, useful all the way because um, it is not a separate section or separate part of gas chromatography. You can buy a column without using the liquid support on the support material. So, so here what is uh, the importance? The importance is permanent gases are usually analyzed using silica columns. In these columns carbon monoxide can be separated from acetylene, but other gases emerge as a single peak. So, uh, if you look at this slide, we can simply use a um, the phi angstrom molecular sieve uh, to separate isomers and straight chain alkanes. Then what happens is straight chain alkanes are absorbed and um, uh, other isomers are not absorbed. So, you can find out how much of the isomers are present. For example, here hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, monoxide etcetera, they can be separated on a 4 feet column packed with 5 angstrom molecular sieve. Remember, there is no liquid, uh, um, there is no liquid uh, material that is there is uh, no liquid support coated on the column material. It is just a column material which is filled with phi angstrom molecular sieve. So, such the, uh, reactions or such separations are known as gas solid uh, separations and um, uh, they are useful anyway. Those uh, who need to separate small uh, gases etcetera small quantities of gases, water, etcetera, small cha straight chain and uh, uh, isomers so substances. 
they can be separated very easily using these things. Now, quantitative evaluation I want to discuss a little bit and um, generally uh, what I would like to say at this point is quantitative evaluation is all about the scores. The all during the course our emphasis has been on the quantitative um, estimations. So, if we use gas chromatography as a quantitative tool to separate the substances and measure the their separations, the output of the recorder and the detector must be linear. That is one of the preconditions that we assume that they must be linear. So, the carrier gas flow rate must be always constant. Then the peak area can be measured by triangulation or integration or planimetry or, uh, or gravimetry. What you can do is you can take the chromatograms on a graph paper and count the number of uh, squares and um, for each component uh, under the that peak of the each component and then uh, you can quantitatively evaluate so many peaks correspond to so much of the quantity that we have uh, injected and then you can quantitatively estimate relatively that is the separation uh, efficiency. So, um, the triangulation also uh, involves some sort of a an approximation in um, uh, assuming that each peak is something like a triangle. So, you have to draw a baseline imagine a triangle in which the whole uh, peak is fitted and then determine the um, quantity. Then um, if you sometimes what people do is uh, because the triangle cannot be fitted very nicely, they go for height multiplied by half of the width. That is also possible uh, to de determine the extent of separation, extent of each peak and then you can cut the chromatographic peaks and weigh them. Uh, this is also a very simple process and it can be done and then electronically of course, it is possible to integrate each peak as we have seen in NMR and other uh, areas and um, you can see that there is some amount of uncertainty involved in all these cases. That means, in planimetry and triangulation there is a standard deviation of uh, uh, the reproducibility is around 4 percent. Whereas, uh, if you measure the each peak uh, by its height multiplied by its half of the width, then the standard deviation comes down to 2.6 and uh, if you use gravimetry it is about 1.7 whereas, in electron in the case of electronic uh, integration it will be 0.44. Nowadays, 90 percent of the gas chromatographic uh, separations are evaluated electronically. So, I am uh, very sure that other methods uh, are almost outdated, but for the sake of brevity I have introduced all these things because quite often we are faced with a situation that integration electronic integration is not always possible and we should be in a position to evaluate and take care of the uh, of the quantitative aspects even when we do not have the uh, electronics and computer at our disposal quite often it happens that we are forced to deal with such things. Now, so if we uh, I will spend a few minutes on the uh, preparative scale gas chromatography. The logic is very simple if we are in a position to separate the components in the micro scale or micro liter scale, why not do it for the exp, uh, uh, scale it up at a higher level for the quantitative separation. Theoretically, it should be possible and it has been made possible and um, such uh, separations if we are able to achieve from the impurities and uh, substances associated isomers etcetera, 
then they could be directly connected with uh, um, with the energy gas chromatography with infrared nmr mass spectrometer etc for the direct uh, uh, identification of the separated substances or they can be um, used for separation so what we go in the case of preparative scale gas chromatography is that they are useful for identification by in IR, NMR and mass spectrometry etcetera. In uh, the requirement in each of these cases is that the columns diameter should be of about should be about 1 to 1.5 centimeter and sample size also can vary from 1 to 1000 milligrams that is you, know, you can even go up to 2 grams. So, from, from a few milligrams to 2 grams substances you can separate. Now, there is a danger of overloading if vapor phase of the sample is greater than 0.5 Vr divided by root n that is a standard uh, uh, indicator equation for us. So, that we, ca we should be able to decide whether a particular gas chromatographic separation can be successful or not that is preparative gas chromatography. So, the column diameter also you can increase up to 3.2 centimeters dia that is the again the guideline here is the column diameter should be 10 times more uh, than the um, 1 centimeter column that is in preparative gas chromatography usual separations if you want to expand from uh, from gas chromatography to preparative gas chromatography column diameter should be increased by about 10 times. So, another approach is repetitive injections instead of using the same column um, with a bigger diameter we can go for repetitive injections and continue the separations that is automatic injections. So, uh, of small samples on narrow uh, diameter columns something like 3 by 8 or 3 fourth inch of diameter the in such cases sample size can vary from 5 to 30 milliliters and a high percentage of liquid phase is also essential and uh, sometimes we, we use short fat columns that is uh, known as high volume preparative work that is uh, very essential for high volume preparative work. So, uh, I would like to say that uh, I have introduced you to different kinds of um, aspects of the gas chromatography during my last discussion and uh, now I would like to spend a few minutes um, on the application of uh, high performance liquid chromatography. Now, what is important in the case of uh, um, high performance uh, liquid chromatography is that separations from gas chromatography to high pressure liquid chromatography. It initially started as a curiosity we have been doing separations of substances in columns uh, using aqueous and non aqueous solutions. So, substances which are volatile we can go for gas chromatography, but suppose you want to separate inorganic ions and then organic ions proteins and then plasma blood plasma and several other uh, systems like that. It is possible to separate them using a simple liquid chromatography. Now, earlier liquid chromatography work was usually carried out in 1.5 centimeter diameter and 50 to 500 centimeter length columns that is something like a burette that is 50 centimeter and 1.5 centimeter dia is a burette. So, you can increase it by about maximum up to 500 centimeter length columns with uh, stationary phase particles of uh, 150 to 200 micrometer diameter. These separations usually took a long time and they lasted for several hours and output flow rates of the eluent were a few tens of millimeters milliliters per minute. 
So, it used to take very long time and then you go to start the experiment, go for coffee, come back, go for lunch and come back by evening again, still the compounds would not be separated. So, the attempts were made to increase the speed by applying vacuum or pumping, uh, but uh, these things were not very effective because increase in flow rates increases the plate heights according to Van Dimter equation. It is a very simple equation defined as h is equal to a plus b bar u plus c u, where a is equal to a, um, uh, h is the plate height, u is the linear velocity of the mobile phase that is in centimeters per second, a, b and c are the coefficients related to the phenomena of multiple flow paths and longitudinal diffusion and mass transfer etcetera between the mobile and solid phase. So, it is not a very simple straightforward equation. So, it is not always uh, very easy, it is not always easy to look for uh, separations using high flow rates and vacuums in liquid chromatography. We are not talking about gas chromatography now, we are talking about liquid chromatography. Therefore, because of all these uh, restraints, uh, what I had described here in um, the longitudinal diffusion, multiple flow paths and mass transfer etcetera, the efficiencies were always low. So, soon scientists realized that major increases in column efficiency can be brought about by decreasing the particle size of the stationary phase to a few microns that is 3 to 10 micrometers. This technology provided sophisticated instruments operating at high pressure, this permits high pressure operations. So, once these techniques were developed, it was realized that high pressure liquid chromatography provides best analytical separations, techn separation technology with high sensitivity, adaptability for quantitative separations. It was suitable for separating the non-volatile or thermary fragile molecules like what I had discussed earlier that is amino acids, pr proteins, nucleic acids, hydrocarbons, carbohydrates, drugs, terpenoids, pesticides, insecticides and several other antibiotics, steroids, metal organic species and metal compounds, polymers and several other classes of compounds could be separated using liquid chromatography and uh, you, only if you are able to separate the uh, use 3 to 10 micrometer particles and pump the liquid through the, the column because uh, smaller the particle the liquid flow rate. Uh, would be lower. So, to maintain the liquid flow rates at higher uh, rates, we had to increase this um, particle pressure. So, that is why it was known as high pressure liquid chromatography and uh, this chroma high pressure liquid chromatography wa was uh, initially about, uh, mm, about 20, 30 years before it was a laboratory curiosity and most of the substances being separated were uh, they, they were simple inorganic solutions, mixtures, effluents and things like that. But subsequently once the, uh, once the separations were achieved, uh, the instrumentation was developed. You will be surprised to know that between 1984 and 86 within 2 years there were about 1500 papers, 300 national and international conferences and more than 100 books and review articles etcetera published within a span of 2 years. So, that is a real development and today the high pressure liquid chromatography is, a, is an essential component of any laboratory worth its name which are dealing with the substances like amino acids and other things what I had told you and um, the, yes, the substances all this because we are able to increase the efficiency 
by increasing the uh, particle size as well as the flow rates because of under uh, because of the high pressure pumps. Now, you can see here in this slide that uh, the linear velocity and plate height I have draw, drawn here. You can see that if the particle size uh, is 6.1 uh, micrometer linear velocity uh, plate height is in uh, uh, millimeter and you can see that the um, effect of particle size on the plate height could be fantastic as shown in this figure. For example, here it is 6.1 this is 8.8 .8, uh, micrometer and the plate height would be still lower and you increase it up to 22.6 your, your normal plate height is of the order of about 0.8 and if you increase it to 34 or for 35 then the effective plate height also will increase depending upon the linear velocity of the effluent of the eluent and 44.7 is something phenomenal. So, the molecular weight the applications and um, the substances um, the classification what we can do is we can have substances with molecular weights up to 10,000 if we have we can go for exclusion chromatography and reverse phase partition and uh, still lower molecular weight ionic species can be separated using ion exchange chromatography and reverse phase partition. Smaller polar non uh, ionic molecules can be separated again using liquid liquid partition chromatography with uh, reverse phase partition and homologous series structural isomers etcetera can be separated using adsorption chromatography and reverse phase partition. So, here is a uh, list cla of classification of the HPLC techniques. Here in the top I have put organic solu organic substances and here I have put the water soluble substances. Among the organics we can classify something like hexane soluble methane, this is soluble methane, this is THF, this is non ionic, this is ionic. So, at one end we have almost non polar substance and at the other end we have water soluble and most polar substances. So, here I have drawn molecular uh, mass and um, the techniques possible techniques I have put uh, uh, here that is size exclusion that is gel permeation, gel filtration and ion exchange and uh, re reverse phase uh, bonded uh, technology for water soluble substances and size exclusion for organic substances. So, size exclusion would work exclusively for uh, substances having 1000, 100,000 molecular weights and uh, from 10,000 up to let us say about uh, 1500 or maybe around 2000 to 1 lakh and above the size exclusion is the technique. Now, here in um, if it is a non polar substance we can go for normal phase uh, normal phase or reverse phase also to some extent if they are polar that is adsorption or bonded uh, columns and then small molecules will be uh, separated by gel permeation and for non ionic and ionic substances we can go for reverse phase uh, uh, substances. Uh, bonded and ion exchange columns. So, early chromatographic uh, uh, chromatographers used highly polar stationary substances phases such as water or triethylene glycol. These substances were used on supported uh, they used to on support used the, um, to coat the silica or alumina and hexane or isopropyl ether etcetera as the mobile phase. This is called as normal phase chromatography in which the least polar substance eluted first. It is it stands to reason uh, that um, 
uh, if the stationary phase is polar and um, silica or alumina are, um, are there, then the uh, it is a separation of least polar substance coming out first and more polar substance gets adsorbed and comes out later. This is known as normal uh, um, the chromatography. In reverse phase chromatography, what we do is take the stationary phase as a non-polar substance, usually a hydrocarbon and mobile phase we are changing it to polar phase that is water, methanol, estonitrile, etcetera. Here the most polar component appears first and increasing the polarity increases the elution time. So, the bonded phase coatings are usually siloxanes formed by the reaction of hydrolyzed surface with an organochlorosilane. The you can see in the slide that uh, SiOH groups are coated with uh, methyl groups and then what you have is silicon uh, bridge followed by methyl groups. The coating is of the order of about 4 micro moles per square meter in the bonded phase. So, packings are classified as reverse phase when the bonded coating is non-polar. This you will have to understand because uh, reverse phase uh, separation is the most followed technique uh, in um, HPLC. So, here I have put R, R is a N octyl or N octyl desyl groups. The particles have a brush or bristle like appearance and uh, nearly 75 percent of the HPLC work is now composed of RPPC that is reverse phase partition chromatography and worldwide HPLC market is of the order of about 1 billion dollars. Already more than uh, several lakhs of HPLC uh, instruments are uh, there all over the world in uh, spread over all over the world in almost every laboratory worth its name. So, pumping pressures of several thousand pounds per square inch are required. So, uh, equipment tends to be more elaborate and expensive because you have to subject the liquids to high pumping pressures. So, reservoirs you would need of 200 to 1000 ml that is the liquid phase eluent equipped with sprayers, vacuum pumping, distillation system, heating, stirring, dust filters, millipore filters and our vacuum constitute other HPLC components. So, uh, sometimes we either we use a single solvent as a mobile phase, in that case we call it isocratic dilution, elution. A mixture of two or three solvents also we can use program it to increase the polarity in a series of steps or continuously and that is known as gradient elution. So, uh, comparison of gradient and isocratic elution I am showing here in this case. So, the top figure is a gradient elution figure in which the substances like benzene, uh, monochlorobenzene, ortho dichlorobenzene 1, 2, 3, tri chlorobenzene etcetera their isomers have been separated in such a beautiful fashion uh, if I use a gradient elution. But if I use a single eluent you can see that the same substances are separated in this way and it in it takes lot of time and it increases the, um, uh, the working expenses. So, it is better to go for gradient elution in um, these things. So, these, these are the substances which have been separated in the previous slide that is benzene, monochlorobenzene, orthodichlorobenzene etcetera. And um, this uh, I am uh, I am not going into details of the of this instrument especially because uh, we are um, we are in a position to understand um, that the complexity and the uh, capability of HPLC is always dictated by the substance uh, by the uh, column material as well as the operator uh, uh, efficiency. So, here is a small list of 
the basic uh, equipment schematic diagram of course, and um, the here this is a regulated helium source and then we have solvent reservoirs 1, 2, 3, 4 here and then uh, from all these things there is a sparger, then uh, the mixer, then uh, for gradient elution etcetera and solvent proportioning valve is there and then it is taken to a pump and output check valve is there, then we have a pulse dampener that is pulse uh, uh, the liquid should be delivered in a uniform manner without much uh, this thing and then we have a small uh, drain wall followed by a priming uh, pumping uh, priming syringe and then the substance enters a pre filter a back pressure regulator pressure transducer and then an injector wall followed by the column and at the end of the column we do have some sort of a detector to separate the component to identify the separated components so, this is essentially a schematic diagram of the substance of the equipment of HPLC and uh, there are lot of developments and I am not going into the details basically because this is almost like a last lecture and I would like to leave something for you to learn on your own, but I want to give you the basic requirement of the gas chromatography. For example, you can see here that pumping systems must have the following capabilities. One is generation of 6000 psi or lbs per inch and what we need is a pulse free input and uh, flow rate should be between 0.1 and 10 milliliter per minute with 0.5 percent reproducibility that places great demands. And then the substances should be corrosion resistance because you are using polar as well as non-polar substances etcetera and especially when you are working with high pressures there is an explosion hazard. So, the explosion hazards must be taken care of there should not be any explosion and there should not be any leakage the moment leakage comes HPLC fails immediately. A variety of pumps are being employed in HPLC work as shown below that is reciprocating pumps, displacement pumps, pneumatic pumps etcetera and computer control servo type delivery type systems are usually ideal. Now, the sample injection I would like to just spend a few minutes, mm, uh, I will introduce you to the concepts now and then request you to look up the aspects what I am going to enumerate on your own. So, that we can uh, you can have a uh, the it is something like an assignment which I have taught you for so long that you would like to. I would like to leave it to you as an assignment. So, the sample uh, injection is a syringe which uh, what you, uh, is through a syringe which can stand up to 1500 psi is very very important and then you need to have stop flow injections. Sampling loops we can incorporate, but they should be capable of withstanding up to 7000 psi. Micro sample injection walls also can introduce uh, samples of 5 to 500 microliters. Now, columns again uh, I cannot over uh, the importance of uh, columns cannot be over uh, emphasized you have to understand that columns are the heart of any chromatographic separation. So, the stainless steel or heavily walled glass tubes of 10 to 30 centimeter you know in a compared to gas chromatography HPLC columns are slightly smaller and they should because uh, uh, maximum uh, length is about 30 centimeter, uh, but they should be capable of withstanding 6000 psi 4 to 10 millimeter inside diameter and 0.5 micrometer particles to provide 40 to 60000 plates per minute per meter. So, the particle size if you have if you employ a column of 1, 1 to 4.6 diameter. 3.5 micrometer particles um, and then 3, 3 to 5 centimeter length these columns offer approximately 100,000 plates per meter. Actually, there is a small mistake here it should be micrometer and um, um, it, it will be corrected subsequently. Such columns have low solvent consumption and 
they can speed up the separations. Now, guard column is another important concept in HPLC that is they should be able to filter and separate irreversibly bonding components. The uh, particles should have similar composition to that of the main analytical column, but slightly larger particle size to minimize the pressure drop. We do not want the pressure drop to happen in the guard column because guard column is only a precautionary column. So, the column thermostats must be capable of controlling temperatures of about plus or minus 0.1 degree centigrade. This we usually accomplish by using the column heater or placing the column in a heated water jacket and the temperature can be maintained very successfully. So, there are uh, pellicular non-porous particles, spherical glass or polymer beads of about 10, 30 to 40 micrometer coated with a thin layer of silica, alumina, polystyrene, divinyl benzene, etcetera. These are the usual some uh, particle compose support uh, column materials and or you can even use ion exchange resins for guard columns and porous particle packings of 3 to 10 micrometers of silicon, al silica, alumina, DVB, ion exchange resin are also useful materials. So, the um, that brings us to the detectors. Generally, detectors are again based on the bulk property of the elements or the solute properties such as absorption, adsorption, fluorescence, etcetera. The bulk property detectors are, uh, are there with um, uh, refractive index, a dielectric constant or density. So, the bulk property means we can determine any sub substance irrespective of the chemical nature and solute properties uh, detectors are based on the materials which are being separated and uh, their characteristics. For example, UV absorbance, fluorescence, diffusion current, etcetera. Most of the HPLC work however, is accomplished by uh, 71 percent uh, ultra UV detectors and 15 percent by fluorescence and 14 percent by other measurements. So, uh, you can uh, if you want to buy a uh, chromato HPLC, you can go for RI and UV that should suffice for most of the routine work. Here I have tried uh, to put the uh, detectors and mass LOD that is limit of detection and then state of the art. For example, in UV visible uh, detector you can have a loading of this much, but the detection limit is of the order of 1 picogram that is how how much the, um, the the technology has advanced for the determining the detection of the substances fluorescence is 10 um, 10 femtograms electrochemical is 100 femtograms that is about 10 raise to minus 13 and ri is 10 nanograms conductivity is 500 picograms and then mass spectrometry if you uh, couple with HPLC it will be about 1 nanogram and FTIR if you use you can determine up to 100 uh, nanograms. So, the uh, one can uh, have an idea about the importance of the specific uh, um, um, detection limit and the power of high pressure liquid chromatography. Here I have a list of small assignments. And uh, if you do this, if you gather information in the, on the style what I have taught you so far on LC pumps, HPLC columns, uh, HPLC detector, sample injection system, sample handling, typical applications to pesticides, insecticides and uh, polymers, ion chromatography, biochemical applications and high pressure liquid chromatography, I am sure you will be able to uh, do justice to uh, high pressure liquid chromatography and you will be an expert um, in this thing. And uh, what I would like to this brings us to the end of our uh, course on NPTEL. I would like to thank you for uh, being with me all these uh, lectures and uh, I have tried to give you an insight into the different kinds of chemical analysis. Um, to be performed 
and that are relevant to modern science and with our world. For example, in the initial courses we had discussed that uh, we had uh, um, uh, we had started right from uh, the atomic structure and then we have tried to understand some of the optics, basic instrumentation followed by the uh, by schematic diagrams of how to combine them together to make an instrument with the course what you have been undergoing in this course. I am sure you will be able to assemble a detector depending upon the substance you want to separate or determine or identify. So, we have I have taught you about uh, the uh, optics, I have taught you about the uh, chemical properties and I have taught you about the schematic diagrams and principles of how the, the detectors and other things work and based on these things we have measured, we have moved on to different kinds of separations and then I, uh, different kinds of identification. Initially, we did conduct uh, some of the uh, our studies on spectrophotometry, fluorescence, x-ray techniques and then there are uh, other substances, uh, other techniques atomic absorption we have spent quite a lot of time and then surface uh, analysis and then electrothermal chemical electrothermal analysis, hydride generation, cold vapor mercury followed by infrared etcetera and several other techniques followed by electrochemical techniques. Among them we have studied in detail about the polarography and uh, which is a very very important technique with respect to electro with respect to electrochemical techniques and uh, I, I would have taught you if the time had permitted on sensors and other uh, related techniques which are the in things now. That is you just carry a sensor and then determine the ambient as well as non ambient uh, uh, circumstances the chemicals which you would like to determine. Subsequently, we have moved on to the chromatography where we have spent lot of time in gas chromatography understanding the basic principles and theoretical aspects etcetera followed by HPLC. I have not taught you uh, HPLC as it should have been taught because I want to leave an impression on you that now you are capable of studying things on your own that is what I want to impart to you along these things. So, with this uh, with these comments, I will leave you now with uh, um, all the best wishes and I would like to thank you for being with me during all these lectures and I wish you all the best. Suppose you need something more, please uh, contact me anytime. Thank you very much.